Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is uh, Sir Faraz Hasni and I'm a director of the Lupus Clinical Research at the National Institutes of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And I'm very happy and uh, excited to present to you about the systemic lupus erythematosus. It's an overview uh, of a disease that uh, is not so common, but you will uh, encounter it uh, maybe once or twice or maybe more in your medical school and then later on in your professional lives you will see uh, patients who either have SLE or systemic lupus erythematosus or uh, you've been asked to evaluate them for uh, rule out SLE. So I think it's an important disease and not only uh, to understand what the disease is and also it's interesting to understand how the immune system which is supposed to protect ourselves uh, can turn on, on on our cells by autoimmune diseases where uh, it starts to attack various parts of our body and leads to this uh, interesting phenomena. So with that introduction, let's begin. And the learning objectives for the today's uh, speech or today's talk is to understand the diagnostic dilemmas in lupus, how to make a diagnosis of lupus um, and how to make sure that the diagnosis is accurate also to understand the pathophysiology of the lupus. So pathophysiology of lupus is rather complex and I'll try to give you a more simplified uh, overview uh, for this short duration of the talk. And then at the end, I will talk a little bit about the current treatment recommendations for lupus. So the first thing first is how to make a diagnosis of lupus. And as I said, this is uh, one of the most challenging diagnoses that you might have to make. And a lot of times uh, patients will be presented who looks like lupus, but they may not have it. And sometimes patients may have lupus and they get misdiagnosed. On average, it takes about five to six years sometimes from the start of the symptoms to the diagnosis of lupus, depending on where you are and who your treating physicians are. So let's start with a case. Um, so this uh, is a case of a 25 year old female and she didn't have any significant past medical history. She presents with some fatigue, uh, joint aches and pains, some arthralgia and a rash. So when you further ask, uh, she tells you that the joint pain with this is present with the stiffness and swelling, and it's usually worse in the morning uh, and it's been present for the about past three months. There is a rash on her face, which gets worse uh, when she goes out in the sun. And then uh, when you ask her in terms of review systems, she tells you that she has fatigue and fever and she also tells you that there is a significant history of acne in the past. So when you do the physical exam, you first look at her face. And then on the face, you see that there is this reddened area on the malar part of the face or the malar region of the face. And also interestingly, you notice that the nasolabial fold is, uh, is paired with this rash. And you look at her hand and these, this, rather subtle, but there is a little bit of swelling of her joints. And when you ask her to open her mouth, you see that there is a little bit, there is a lesion in the roof or the um, heart palate of the mouth. So with these uh, diagnosis or this uh, history and then physical exam, uh, you order some blood work and then you look at the blood work and you see that the white blood cell count is slightly low at three. Uh, the hemoglobin is also low for her age at 10. The platelet count is also 112. And then look at the differential of the white count, the absolute lymphocyte count is 500. And you order a ESR or erythrocyte sedimentation rate and it comes back high at 60. Uh, looking at the chemistry profile, the serum creatinine is 1.6. The estimated GFR is 55. So a little bit on the lower end. And you look at the urine, there is a number of RBCs in the urine, which is abnormal. And then uh, when you do the dip stick, uh, it shows that there is a three plus protein in the urine. So with this um, history and physical exam and these abnormal lab values, uh, you uh, come to this conclusion that this person has a multi-system inflammatory disease because multiple systems in the bodies are involved and the inflammatory markers are high. So you say that this is a multi-system inflammatory disease. And of course, uh, being a student clinician, you think of the differential diagnosis of a multi-system inflammatory disease and uh, lupus comes to your mind. So in order, so you order another test, which is called the anti-nuclear antibody test or ANA. Um, and the test 
comes back positive at a tighter one to 640. So now you have to think, uh, how do you make the diagnosis of lupus? So you have the history, um, you have the physical exam, and then you have abnormal labs. Um, and then now try to fit all of this together. So let's try to uh, think a little bit about how we make a diagnosis of lupus and how do you uh, come uh, to label somebody is having lupus. So what do you do? So first thing is that, uh, what do all lupus patients have in common? So all of them uh, will have an anti-nuclear antibody test. So the ANA or anti-nuclear antibody test is uh, what it is. So what it is that it's the autoantibodies, which is the antibodies produced by your own body against your own protein, uh, which are uh, against various components of the cell nucleus. So that's why its name is anti-nuclear antibody. Um, and then it's present in many autoimmune dis disorders, uh, but it's also present in some healthy subjects. So it's very sensitive, but it's not specific for lupus. And then we will discuss this point a little bit more in detail that what does it exactly mean in context of lupus. So um, when you look at the incidence of positive ANA or anti-nuclear antibody, it's uh, present in anywhere from three to 4% of the normal subject. In lupus subjects, anywhere from 95 to 99% of the subjects with lupus will have a positive ANA um, to the point that some people, uh, some lupus experts in the world will believe that uh, there is no such entity as a negative ANA negative lupus. It's also present in some of the other autoimmune diseases, such as scleroderma, uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, about 50% of the patients have it. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, again, another 50% would have it. Um, interestingly, uh, as uh, patients grow older in age, uh, if they have any chronic infections and also have other chronic health conditions, the incidence of uh, positive ANA increases. So what does that mean? So what it means, uh, it's uh, shown here in this uh, review article by uh, Robert Schemling in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2003, that the majority of the uh, people will have a negative ANA as you look at this pie chart. And there will be some who would have a positive ANA, which is a small part of the pie, but majority of those with the positive ANA will have an ANA with an uncertain clinical significance. So if ANA comes back positive, it does not automatically mean that somebody has a disease. It does not, definitely does not mean that somebody has lupus. So a uh, majority of the people can have any positive ANA without having anything. Um, but then a small subset of them would have autoimmune diseases as we just discussed, such as lupus, or they can have other diseases such as Sjogren's syndrome or scleroderma. Um, and otherwise there are other non-rheumatic diseases and there's a whole list of them listed here, uh, things like Hashimoto thyroiditis, we just discussed, grave disease, autoimmune hepatitis, primary biliary cirrhosis, primary autoimmune cholangitis, chronic infections such as hepatitis C, HIV, and many other. So, so this is a very important point to keep in mind. So um, uh, it's to the point that as a rheumatologist, somebody uh, refers a patient to me uh, as having a positive ANA, it sometimes gives me chest pain because uh, Again, uh, when an ANA is done improperly, uh, it uh, does not yield uh, enough information, but when done in the proper setting, it's very useful. So what does that mean? Because it has low specificity, the usefulness of an ANA increases if the pretest probability for lupus or any disease is high. For example, if somebody has symptoms and signs that can be attributed to the lupus, such as the clinical vineyard that we just talked in the beginning of, the, uh, of this uh, discussion, uh, the patient has signs and symptoms which uh, are sort of suggestive of systemic lupus erythematosus or at, li at least suggestive of a, a multi-system inflammatory disorder. And in that case, uh, since the pretest probability is high, when you order an ANA and if it comes back positive, it's of very high value. Um, however, um, this uh, sensitivity of ANA means that if patient who has a negative ANA is unlikely to have lupus, because um, if you have the high probability, uh, pretest probability, and the ANA comes back positive, it means you have lupus. But if it comes back negative, there's a very high chance that this is some other disease and it's not lupus. 
So again, just to kind of wrap your head around this concept that ANA is a highly sensitive test, but it has a very low specificity, which means that when it's present in the, in the right clinical setting, it's very useful. Um, but uh, just having an ANA being present does not automatically mean that somebody had lupus. So um, I'll be happy to discuss more offline. And if you, any of you would like to approach me, um, I'll be happy to discuss it on a one-to-one -one basis to kind of explain this uh, concept a little bit more in, in detail. So um, ANA is not the only antibody that is present uh, in lupus. There are other autoantibodies. And more importantly, the next in line is the anti-double-stranded DNA, which is a very highly specific antibody. So which means that if somebody has an anti-double-stranded DNA, there is close to 95% chance that they have lupus. However, the sensitivity of anti-double-stranded DNA is low, meaning that there could be patients who have lupus with a negative double-stranded DNA. So it's sort of opposite of the ANA. So ANA is... Um, can be present without lupus, whereas DNA, uh, whereas somebody can have lupus without having a DNA. But if they have uh, anti double stranded DNA, there's like 95% chance that they have lupus. Uh, similarly, another antibody is anti Smith or SM antibody, which is again very highly specific for lupus, but with a low sensitivity. Uh, and also the anti RNP, uh, anti SSA, and anti SSB autoantibodies, as well as anti phospholipid antibodies can also be present in patients with lupus. The third um, column uh, on the right uh, is about the clinical association. So these autoantibodies not only have various degrees of sensitivity and specificity, they are also associated with certain clinical uh, markers. So patients who have anti double stranded DNA, um, they are more likely to have nephritis, but does not always mean that, but they could have that. The anti-Smith is not very specific, so it doesn't have any specific clinical manifestations associated with it. The anti-RNP antibody is associated with more arthritis, myositis, and lung manifestations of lupus. The anti-SSA and SSB autoantibody or uh, Sjogren's syndrome A and Sjogren's syndrome B autoantibodies are, as the name suggests, is associated with Sjogren's syndrome and also associated with dry eyes and dry mouth. Uh, subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus, neonatal lupus, and also uh, the presence of these autoantibodies increases the photosensitivity, meaning that when the patient goes out in the sun, then they will have more chances of breaking out in the rash if they have these autoantibodies present. And the antiphospholipid antibodies are usually present with uh, increased chances of clotting, such as deep venous thrombosis and arterial thrombosis and pulmonary embolism and, and so forth. So um, the other interesting fact about the autoantibodies is that, that these can be present many years before the disease even begin. So for example, the ANA can be present in about 78% of the patients for about uh, three and a half years before the diagnosis. And uh, however, we don't have any way to, uh, to sort of predict that if somebody has a positive antibody that they may or may not uh, have a disease later in their life. So if somebody comes to you with a high titer positive ANA and they don't fulfill all the criteria for lupus, uh, our uh, job as clinicians is to monitor them closely and uh, follow them closely to see if indeed in the next few years they develop uh, full-blown lupus or not. And this study was done um, uh, where you look at the graph, which is uh, showing what I just described. And this was study was done in the military recruits where the blood has been stored for a number of years. And they went back and look at the autoantibody levels in the stored blood. And it nicely shows that these autoantibodies are present several years before they were diagnosed. So this is the area, when, this is the time when the patients were diagnosed and the autoantibodies are present uh, for several years before these uh, patients were diagnosed with uh, lupus. So, and then once they are diagnosed with lupus, pretty much all of them have autoantibodies. So again, a very interesting fact about uh, when to check the ANAs and double-stranded DNA, and what does that mean in the clinical context when the symptoms are present and when the symptoms are not present. So that is something that uh, gives a better understanding about the disease process. So 
Uh, and the summary of the first part of my talk is when to consider a diagnosis of lupus. So it is, it's, it is a disease which is uh, more common in women out of nine out of 10 patients or the 90% of patients are female. And it uh, even though it can be started at any age, but usually it's seen in the women of childbearing age. So usually younger women starting from teens to 20s uh, and in the earlier ages of the life and uh, later in in the life, uh, the incidence goes down, but it's not doesn't go down to zero. So even if somebody is elderly, you can still diagnose them with lupus, but the chances are less of having them lupus at the age 60 or or 65 or what have you. Um, then uh, the other things are the constitutional symptoms such as fever, fatigue, weight loss. Uh, those are the condition. Those are present in the diagnosis of lupus, and usually. Uh, because of these non-specific symptoms, patients don't get diagnosed on time. Um, the, the rash that is associated with lupus is typically photosensitive rash, gets worse with uh, going out in the sun. Um, the oral ulcers or nasal ulcers, as we saw in this in the picture of the patient that I show you, uh, is also very common. Usually it's in the heart palate, usually it's asymptomatic, so you have to examine the patient to make sure that you're not missing an oral ulcer or a nasal ulcer. Arthritis is usually present, but usually it's worse in the morning and it is associated with morning stiffness. Uh, kidney involvement is also very common and various cytopenia, such as anemia, low WBC count, low uh, platelet count, low uh, lymphocyte counts are all present in uh, patients with lupus. The diagnosis of lupus up until more recently was based on the American College of Rheumatology classification criteria. And this criteria is about 95% specific and 85% sensitive. And uh, to meet the diagnostic criteria, uh, somebody has to have four out of 11, at least four out of 11 of these criteria. Now there is a newer, two newer criteria are also out there and I have not shown that uh, because they're rather new and they're not widely accepted yet. Uh, but maybe in the next few years or so, you will uh, hear more about those. Uh, so um, you look at the list and then see what are the things that were present in the patient that I discussed earlier. So the patient had malar rash, as I showed you that the rash was in the malar region and it was uh, sparing the nasolabial fold. And that's an important distinction to make. It was photosensitive because the patient told you that when she goes out in the sun, the rash gets worse. When you look in her mouth, there was an oral ulcer on the heart, heart palate. And also she also had arthritis. In addition to that, on the blood test, you saw that she had anemia, she had uh, lymphopenia and also had thrombocytopenia. So she meets that criteria also. And finally, when we ordered the ANA, that came back positive too. So this patient that we have discussed meets at least six out of the 11 criteria. So the diagnosis of lupus is being made in this patient and uh, which was our guest from the beginning and the, the, the title of the talk is also lupus. So it's kind of obvious that the patient had lupus. So with this now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the pathogenesis of lupus. So the pathogenesis of lupus, uh, there are certain risk factors that have been identified for somebody to develop this autoimmune phenomena with multi-system uh, in, in inflammatory disease. So there is a genetic risk factors. There are certain genes that have been identified and if somebody is born with those genetic risk factors, then they are more likely to have lupus. Then on top of it, uh, there could be some uh, risk behaviors or some environmental triggers that uh, goes into play where somebody with an appropriate genetic background, uh, if they get exposed to these behaviors such as smoking, stress, certain toxins, or some certain environmental triggers that are certain antigens, uh, hormones, most commonly estrogen, uh, certain infections, medication, and sun exposure, and all of these coming together uh, lead to the increased risk of developing lupus. The genetic susceptibility, so it's not um, a monogenic disease, so there is no one single gene that uh, somebody would have and that will put them at a higher risk of lupus, but there are multiple uh, genes, uh, up to 50 potential candidate genes that can contribute to the disease pathology. Um, and the, the fact is kind of illustrated by the fact that the rate of lupus concordance in monozygotic twins is about 24 to 35%. In the dizygotic twins, it's about two to 5%. So again, uh, not a huge genetic dose, but there is a genetic component there. 
then about 10 to 12 percent of lupus patients have either a first or a second degree relative with lupus, which is uh, as compared to less than one person in healthy individuals. So again, pointing to the fact that genes do play a part. Uh, and then uh, SLE patients uh, may have family members with other autoimmune diseases or with lupus. So again, uh, there is some familial clustering there too. Uh, looking at the pathophysiology, again, um, just kind of reiterating the point that I discussed earlier, that uh, there is genetic alterations, genetic background, and on top of it, there are environmental factors, and these lead to um, abnormal functioning, uh, dendritic cells, uh, B cells, and T cells. So there is an abnormality in both the innate immune system as well as the adaptive immune system, and this dysregulated abnormal immune system leads to uh, certain pro-inflammatory molecules such as pro-inflammatory cytokines and also leads to an increased formation of autoantibodies where the antibodies that start to attack the self proteins. And this kind of perpetuates into um, more of a vicious cycle where uh, all of these abnormalities leads to further abnormalities in the immune system. And this keep on going into circle with more and more pro-inflammatory cytokines and more and more autoantibodies being formed. And these autoantibodies then combined with the self antigen to form the immune complexes or ICs. And when these uh, you know, autoantibody antigen immune complexes are formed, they lead to tissue injury. And similarly, the pro inflammatory molecules also lead to tissue injury, which causes tissue damage and leads to the clinical manifestations of lupus. So, this is in a nutshell how we think about the pathophysiology of lupus. Of course, things are way more uh, complicated than this. And I just presented to you in a very simplified form about uh, how these various factors interact and how does the both the innate and the adaptive immune systems in, are involved and how it leads to a vicious cycle of uh, perpetuating the immune dysregulation, which is the, the at the underlying um, basis of the pathophysiology of lupus. So with this um, pathophysiology, now let's talk a little bit about the treatment for lupus. So uh, before we go more into the, into the treatment of lupus, uh, I just wanted to show you a little bit about uh, why it is important to treat lupus patients, because uh, as you look at this, uh, the life expectancy of the patients with lupus, which is depicted by the solid line in the middle, is uh, significantly lower then uh, the age and gender matched healthy, uh, healthy controls, healthy females as well as healthy males. And then furthermore, the, the dotted line in below the uh, solid line, it shows that uh, the patients who have lupus and in addition to that, if they have kidney disease or kidney damage, their life expectancy is further reduced. So what it means is that the life expectancy on average uh, of a lupus patient is 12 years less than uh, their age and gender matched controls who don't have lupus. So somebody got diagnosed with lupus at age 20, they're expected to live 12 years less than somebody who didn't have lupus. And similarly, if they have kidney involvement, the life expectancy is uh, 15 years less than somebody who doesn't have lupus. And furthermore, if the renal disease lead to actual renal damage, uh, then the life expectancy is further reduced by close to 24 years. So somebody with uh, lupus with the kidney damage, uh, they are expected to, uh, to die 24 years earlier than uh, somebody who did not have lupus or did not have any renal damage. So it's pretty, uh, uh, pretty uh, in impressive numbers. And especially to keep in mind that this is a disease where usually more younger females are involved. So if somebody who was 20 years old, if they, you take out the 10 to 15 years of their life, it's a significant number of years that is taken out of their life uh, because of the diagnosis of lupus. So it's important to, uh, to treat these patients, to identify them, and also to treat them uh, accordingly. So what are the various predictors of disease activity and, and severity? So it's, it's a disease which is characterized by periods of flare and remission. The predicted of flares are uh, if the complement protein, C3 and C4 specifically, uh, they uh, are going down significantly. So there's an evidence of their consumption. If the anti double stranded DNA titer starts to rise fastly, if the SESR or the erythrocyte sedimentation rate is increased, which is a marker of inflammation, 
if the lymphopenia uh, is new onset, uh, meaning the absolute lymphocyte count is 500 or less, uh, those are all predictors of, uh, of, of flare. Uh, there is usually abrupt onset of symptoms, which is also uh, associated with increased disease activity and severity. If there is a renal, neurological, hematological, or serological involvement, uh, if the subjects who are African American, um, less likely to encounter in Pakistan, but well, if you go out of the Pakistan, somebody has uh, African American descent, they have uh, much more severe disease. Uh, if the disease started at a much younger age, uh, male uh, tend to do worse than female with lupus, even though the number of male lupus patients is significantly less. Uh, since a disease, 90% of the patients are female, but if a male gets lupus, then they tend to do worse than female counterparts. Uh, patients with lower socioeconomic status due to multiple reasons, they also tend to do worse if uh, they get lupus. So what are the therapeutic strategies for treating lupus? So uh, usually uh, we um, base the strategy into four pillars. The one is to the induction of the remission, which means that to putting the fire out, meaning that uh, putting the disease under control, then once the disease is under control, the second part of the strategy is to maintenance therapy, is to make sure that the uh, fire is out and it stays out by the maintenance therapy. And then the supportive care to make sure that the uh, other issues that can cause problems such as infections, uh, cancers, which are much more higher in incidence in patients with lupus, they've been taken care of. So that's what meant by supportive care. And the last but not least is the quality of life. So the quality of life is also a major issue in patients with lupus since they have fatigue, they have tiredness, they're not able to uh, go to school or uh, they're not able to be employed in meaningful employment. So all of those things matter. So improving the quality of life is also a important strategy for therapeutic, um, therapeutic targeting. So other thing is to titrate the dose to treat effectively with focus on involved organs and to minimize toxicity. What it means is that when the treatments are given, which are usually immunosuppressive medications, uh, mostly steroids or other disease modifying agents. So we want to give them enough to control the disease and, and to protect the organs, but at the same time to minimize the toxicity because all of these medications are highly toxic. They have so many side effects. We want to give only the amount that is needed. Uh, also, the preventive therapies I just mentioned about antibiotics, vaccinations, and things like that, uh, cardiovascular screening, since car risk of cardiovascular disease or premature atherosclerosis is much more higher in patients with lupus as compared to non-lupus patients, and also cancer screening. Again, the risk of cancer, the incidence of cancer is much higher in patients with lupus as compared to um, patients with non-lupus. And lastly, but not least, is the osteoporosis screening. Since we give a lot of steroid to treat the patients, again, osteoporosis, uh, identifying osteoporosis and treating them appropriately, because that's also a higher uh, morbidity and mortality associated with patients with lupus. What are the current medications? So uh, the ones approved by FDA, uh, the first and the foremost was aspirin in 1940, but of course, nobody uses aspirin to treat lupus anymore. The steroids were discovered in 1948, and they were approved by FDA for treatment of lupus, and they still to date continue to be one of the major um, medications to be used for treating lupus. Hydroxychloroquine is uh, very much in the news these days because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and it's been approved for lupus since 1955, and it's been a very effective treatment. And in fact, the recommendation is to put each and every patient of patients with lupus on hydroxychloroquine unless there is a contraindication. Um, and then uh, one of the newer medications approved is called Belumumab, which is approved uh, a few years ago and has been increasingly being used to treat patients with lupus. The non-FD approved medications such as cyclophosphamide, which in higher doses are used to treat cancer, but in lower doses to treat lupus, uh, methotrexate, mycophenolate mofetil, azathioprine, and rituximab. And all of these medications are immunosuppressive medications and uh, they are used in lower doses as compared to the cancer, but they are very effective in controlling the manifestations of lupus and controlling the disease activity and so forth. Uh, the limitations of the current therapy, of course, the immunosuppressive drugs, they suppress the immune system, so there is an increased risk of infection. 
there is an increased risk of cancer. When you use medications such as cyclophosphamide, there's an increased risk of infertility because it causes damage to the ovarian cells. Uh, the side effects of the steroid, which are one of the major uh, medications used to treat lupus, uh, of course, infections, pushing wide appearance, osteoporosis, osteonecrosis, diabetes, mood disturbances, hypertension, and a very long list of problems with the steroid. So we want to minimize the use of steroid as much as possible. This is just a quick uh, look at uh, what are the different areas therapeutic targets which are uh, in the pipeline and which you may see in few years coming out. So as you can see with this very busy slide that various portions of the immune system, both the innate side and the adaptive side have been targeted to treat lupus and these immune pathways can be mitigated uh, in with various uh, molecules, both the injectable and oral different medications are in the pipeline. People are trying to, um, to find a cure for lupus or at least find a better way of treating lupus. And all of these medications and several more are being uh, various stages of development, but we have yet to see uh, a new medication being approved for lupus. The last one approved in 2011 was map. So this, one of the last slides that I have is uh, lupus in summary. So this is a clinical disease uh, which is characterized by multiple organ involvement and it is characterized by various periods of flare and remission and leads to organ damage, most notably renal damage. Uh, the pathogenesis is related to genetically susceptible uh, factors which are combined with the environmental and behavioral triggers and the immune dysregulation is characterized by autoantibody production and inflammatory cytokine productions. The treatment is targeted to clinical manifestations, as well as also the severity of the organ system being involved. And also another important part of the treatment is supportive care and improving the quality of life. So with that, I would like to thank, and I would like to thank uh, the, the Genesis Medical University uh, Association of uh, North America for giving me this opportunity, this educational activity is supported by them. And I like to thank your attention uh, for listening to me and I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, if you have after listening to this. Thank you.